Okay, so some common diseases that we have, um, there's quite a few. <laughs> <So> <laughs> just to put them out there so you've heard of them, from in our young stock, so newborn to weaning, um, the first thing that I think about with newborns is hypoglycemia, so that low blood sugar um, and hypothermia. Those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, depending on how old they are, you know, if they're only a few hours old, it's probably primarily hypothermia. Um, and then they can get hypoglycemia because of it, because they're shivering so much and they shiver and they have a lot of brown fat that they're born with. And that when that fat burns, it literally is exothermic. So they, it makes them warm, but they burn through it really fast, especially when they're cold. Um, and so then they have fewer energy reserves um, and you can get, okay, so that's a good question. Um, so warm first or glucose first. So because they're hypoglycemic, typically we, we want to add glucose first to the system, but that said, it depends on what type, what type of sugar we're using. Um, because if we warm them up and they're really hypothermic, basically warming them up makes their metabolism go faster and then they can get seizures because they don't have enough sugar for their brain. Um, so hypothermia when they're hypoglycemic is protective um, of their kind of metabolic functions. So in older, so let's say 12 hours or older lambs and kids, we want to make sure that they have a sugar source and that can be if they're really hypothermic that's usually going to be through um, a 10 percent dextrose solution that would go into their belly uh, through an injection and that is something that your vet can teach you how to do they can teach you how to make that up it has to be made up usually because usually the dextrose we get is 50 percent so they would teach you exactly which volumes to mix Together and how to get that safely. Um, and, then, and then we would warm them. For really young ones, we want to get them warmed up and make sure that they have colostrum. So usually with the less than 12 hours old, we can give them colostrum as a source of energy to get them warmed up. In these older ones, giving them colostrum first, they um, usually don't have that muscle there to keep it down so they can regurgitate and then aspirate, which then will cause pneumonia later. Um, there is a really good resource on that um, through, it's called OMAFRA. It's a Canadian animal health. It's like a government <laughs> website I, through Canada. <laughs> well, I'll try to send that to everybody. Um, Rosie and I will send that link to everybody. Yeah. Sounds good. And I I'm, had meant to put it on my website, but I don't know if I had after that podcast I did with Ryan, because I talked about it then too. Um, but yeah, so that's a really good resource, but we will email it out to everyone uh, for sure. And then navel ale is another thing that I think about right after birth, something that we can prevent. Um, typically, we don't see the outcome of an infected navel for about you know, maybe at five days or up to two weeks. Um, and then certainly diarrhea is something that I think everyone struggles with um, at times. And then pneumonia, we can tend to see pneumonia um, peaking right around three weeks of age. And then uh, white muscle disease. So white muscle disease is selenium deficiency. And um, yeah, and um, We'll talk about navel ill a little bit more in a minute. Um, so selenium deficiency is something that um, it's usually a regional issue. Uh, and I've, I've worked with some folks that they didn't really see. So selenium deficiency or white muscle disease presents as weakness in their lambs or kids and really bad white muscle disease. These animals can't get up, they're really weak. Um, and then sometimes it also affects their heart muscle and they'll die basically from heart failure. Um, kind of mild white muscle disease is 
where they can't swallow really well. So when they're suckling, it might just be leaking right into their lungs. So you may have a lot more pneumonia early on. So before that three weeks of age, that might be something to look at your selenium levels in your animals. Um, and giving a BOC injection at birth would be something that might help with that. Um, sore mouth and then this is also the moment where we might, if we have a lot of chronic diseases like Yoni's disease or CAE um, or CL, <laughs> these, this is the moment where we might think about um, an opportunity to try to control those. Um, in adults, there's, <laughs> they live a long time. There's opportunities for all kinds of diseases. Some of these are gonna kill them before you even know they're sick. So um, enterotoxemia is an example of that. Um, some of these might be seasonal, like blue tongue and foot rot. Others, um, you know, might be like we have our reproductive diseases and then our chronic diseases that I mentioned. So, and I can probably PDF these slides and send them out if that's helpful. Um, okay, so understanding transmission routes is really helpful for knowing kind of an approach to controlling these diseases. Um, so we have aerosols, so that's just spreading through respiratory droplets, direct contact, so that could be nose to nose, could be hoof to hoof. We'll give examples of each of these. Um, fomites, so this resource is through the Iowa State website, it's the Center for um, Food Safety and Public Health, and they're in, for them, they consider feed and water a fomite um, equipment, uh, housing, soil, and then even hide and wool. Um, and then oral or ingestion, and then vectors. So vectors are um, things that bite. So it could be, or in animals that kind of spread disease from one place to another. A vector could be a bird. Often we talk about coelacoides midges that spread blue tongue, um, or mosquitoes can be a vector. Okay, so when we think about biosecurity, maybe the mental image that you get is people in moon suits and moon boots and closed doors, animals in barns, um, but biosecurity can have a number of different levels. Um, so there's day-to-day -day biosecurity things that we do all the time. And then there's um, kind of your um, extended situation, so special situations, if we have foreign animal disease, that would be like the highest level of biosecurity in order to protect not only your animals, but your profitability, your operation, and make sure that you can stay in production and move product off farm. Um, so when we think of kind of our day-to-day, year-to-year biosecurity, we might think about screening animals that come in for diseases that maybe you don't have. Um, so, you know, or if we're trying to control CL or we're trying to control um, CAE or OPP, those might be things that you choose to screen before you bring them into your, um, to your animals. Um, isolation pens and, and animal movement can be a way to help minimize the spread of disease. Um, so that's more biocontainment. But you know, if we have sick animals, we might think about where we would put them um, or moving animals away from them. Since you know, if we're in a pasture type situation, maybe they contaminated a certain pasture and just moving, keeping sick animals together and moving unaffected animals away, um, especially for abortions and things like that. Um, isolation pens can also be helpful when we are bringing in new additions and we wanna monitor them for a time period before we start commingling animals. It's not only helpful from a disease transmission standpoint, but it also might be helpful from an animal stress and how they express <laughs> that disease. Because if they've had an opportunity to kind of get off the trailer, adapt kind of <laughs> to their new surroundings before they have to establish a new hierarchy with a new flock or herd, it can be helpful to have that time. Um, before they're commingled. Um, hygiene and sanitation is important depending on where we are. So if we're going to show sites, we wanna make sure that those that facility is cleaned before we're building our own pens on top of old pens um, within our own facility. Maybe we have certain areas that 
are important to keep clean. Um, and then traffic control so that people and equipment, um, this would might look very different on a place that has, you know, gates and a barn. Um, you can probably a bit easier control where people park and where people are allowed to go. Um, we tend to think if they're walking through barns, you wanna make sure that they're going through animals that are more susceptible to disease to less susceptible. So you would, an example would be going to young stock first and then to your older animals so that you're not bringing these diseases from your older animals to your younger animals um, or feeding your home flock before going to feed your new additions that you're trying to kind of keep separate for a bit. Um, if you're out in a pasture situation, this looks totally different. Um, so you might think about, you know, if you had to implement a biosecurity plan, what that would look like if you had an entrance and an exit and things like that. So um, Dan and I are actually going to workshop on that next week. So <laughs> more, more to report there. All right, so cleaning and disinfecting, and this can be for equipment, this can be for trailers. Um, the most important part, you can see that 80% is the cleaning. So we wanna remove debris, use soap, rinse and let it dry. And then disinfectant is kind of that last tier. And that would help with um, things like cryptosporidium that are really hard to kill, um, toxiella, certain bacteria that are really hardy and hard to kill. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're using the labeled directions for our disinfectant so that they actually are effective. And then always keeping in mind that a lot of the diseases that we see in sheep and goats can be zoonotic. So those that actually that resource on transmission had highlighted the ones that are zoonotic. So which means that they can also potentially infect people. Um, so it's important to remember how to keep yourself and others safe. Um, and that's especially true in lambing and kidding areas. Um, usually we'll see problems with people um, pressure washing barns um, after, between kiddings and it aerosolizes everything. And so that's kind of a high risk activity. Um, so you wanna keep things dry and definitely clean. Um, but if we're doing stuff that causes a lot of dust and things like that in kidding areas, then that might be a time to think about wearing those N95 masks, which we're all very familiar with now, um, but that can help minimize your own exposure to these different pathogens. Okay, so I have a few examples of specific diseases that are transmitted differently, so we can talk about how we approach control to these different diseases. Um, so for navel ill, this is basically where um, you have, a, you typically see the impact of this disease between when they're born to two week old. Um, you can see uh, these diseases kind of linger as well. So you may see swollen joints or abscesses later on, but usually they're apparent around uh, one to two weeks of age. So it's caused by a bacteria that goes up the umbilicus after they're born. And you can see umbilical abscesses. Um, they can cause um, abdominal hernias, so where you get kind of a, a hole in their abdominal cavity on the bottom. And it, it's not like a hole to the world. It's just a pocket that stays open for a while. Um, and then you can get swollen and painful joints and liver abscesses. So this is because that umbilicus when they're born is basically like a straw and it can suck any of the bacteria that they're exposed to in their lambing or kidding environment right up it. Um, and that bacteria can go into their blood and that's how it gets into the joints um, or it can just shoot over to the liver and cause liver abscesses. Um, so this is, these are usually bacteria that are in the environment um, not a lot that we can do to prevent this in pasture lambing situations per se. You know, we're not, not necessarily going to be picking up all the manure in the pastures, but maybe one way to minimize risk in a pasture lambing situation is to think about your stocking density um, in that situation. So if they have more space than 
they're less likely to be exposed to contaminated pasture um, from fecal. Um, and then in barn or um, shed lambing or titting situations, making sure that the bedding is dry um, and change um, between, especially between ewes and does is really helpful. Um, another thing that we do to prevent is either navel dips or sprays. And unfortunately, iodine has been heavily regulated. And so we can't get 7% iodide um, anymore. And so what you see on the shelf is actually 1% iodide. Um, and it's a bit less, it's not as effective. Um, some people really like it because then they can tell that it's, um, that it's been done. So, right, because it's got that big red um, orange color, so you know that it's been done. But there are other solutions like chlorhexidine, um, there's zetracin that's pretty effective. Um, so there are other solutions that are effective as well. Um, and basically what we wanna do, I saw the, about cutting the cord. So the with the cord, if it's really long, then either they'll step on it and rip it too short, or it touches the ground and it increases the chance of bacteria coming up. So we want that cord to be right around two to three inches long. And if it's naturally that length, then don't worry about cutting it. Um, if it's shorter, that's fine. <laughs> but basically that's the ideal length. Um, and then we want to either dip it or spray it. And if we are dipping it, then we want to make sure that the container that we're using to dip is clean. If you can imagine if there's dirt or manure or dust in that the navel dip that we're putting on that can introduce infection. Um, and Rosie, we're 20 minutes out. <laughs> so you know. <laughs> and I'm like halfway through. Cool. Okay, moving on. Uh, coccidia. So typically affects animals two to five months old. Um, highest risk is around weaning, and that's because of a change of diet. They can, um, so usually we see diarrhea, poor growth, and weight loss. Transmission is fecal oral. And so this coccidia, and like most parasites, when they're shed, they are not infective right away. They have to coccidia sporulate. Um, other parasites just go through larval stages. Um, but basically, there's a period of time from when they are excreted in the manure and when they can be infective to new animals or the same animal. Um, for coccidia, it's two to seven days. And that range is either due to species of coccidia or also environmental conditions. So how wet it is, how warm it is, how cold it is. <laughs> um, and so as far as prevention and control goes, we know that these coccidia is everywhere. Adults have it. and we don't see clinical signs in adults and that's unless they're immunocompromised for some reason. Um, so we know that they do get an immunity to coccidia. So it is important that they have some exposure to coccidia. We don't want to use anti-coccidials in our babies so that they never get to see this disease. They need to develop an immunity. So these pictures on the right, this is mono, these are monocytes, which are part of that innate immune system that are attacking coccidia. And they're very, they can um, kill coccidia at all its different life stages, um, very effective. But babies, as we know, don't have a very well-developed immune system. So a key for helping them develop immunity without getting clinical disease is controlling their exposure. Controlled exposure can come in the form of vaccines, which we do not have in this country, or trying to minimize the amount of infection in their environment. So when we think about lambs or kids that are exposed, they get, if they're exposed from their dam or they're exposed from the environment that was uh, contaminated from last year, um, they're gonna be exposed to small numbers. But when it goes through their gut, that coccidia multiplies like crazy and they'll shed hundreds of thousands of coccidia in their manure. And then that can expose the next week's lamb or, you know, so it kind of goes through this cycle. Um, and, you know, it takes about 10 to 14 days to pass through their life cycle in the gut. So it would be two weeks later, they're exposing that next lamb 
um, that hit the ground at that time, and they're exposed to huge numbers. So that's where either moving animals um, can help or grouping them by age. So I know a lot of folks with fairy goats will make sure that they keep kind of kid cohorts in certain by age groups. Um, or, you know, with sheep operations that are moving, they're going to move animals every so often, whether it's five or seven days, so that they're not getting exposure from this kind of what these lambs and kids have seen. Um, there are coccidiostats and nutritional support that can be done at weaning, and the coccidiostats kind of have to be fed through that weaning period, because the moment that we stop feeding them, it doesn't have an, a residual effect. Um, Okay, pneumonia is a big problem and it can happen from, you know, like I said, they can get aspiration pneumonia right when they hit the ground. They can get pneumonia from viral or bacterial causes, um, like infectious, uh, can, uh, contagious causes peaking at three weeks of age, and then they can get pneumonia from weaning to adults. Um, so typically we think of pneumonia as being induced by stress, so whether it's from shipping, weather extremes, poor nutrition, or they're dealing with other infections, so whether that's CL or something else that's kind of taxing their immune system already, um, and then they can kind of break with pneumonia in a situation where they may not have otherwise. Um, we can see this kind of uh, respiratory disease complex like they see in cattle where they get viruses first and then bacteria, but especially young sheep and goats can just get primary bacterial infections. Um, and you may see fever, um, poor growth and weight loss um, and difficulty breeding in pretty bad cases. Uh, an important note though, is that especially in young lambs and kids a few weeks old, it's really important to make sure that they don't also have scours. So animals with really bad diarrhea can breathe really hard and it looks like pneumonia, but it might actually just be primarily the diarrhea that they have um, because of the changes that it causes with acid base. Um, again, this is usually aerosol or direct contract, uh, contact. Um, prevention is usually by keeping them warm and dry. Um, improving barn ventilation can help. And one thing to remember is that they're really low to the ground. And so while we're standing there, we might think, oh, this is great. But if we're using like straw bedding or something like that, that might have a lot of dust, it's important to kneel down and kind of experience what they're experiencing um, to get a better idea of how well ventilated their environment is. Um, try to minimize high stress events as much as possible. Um, which might be like the time or handling um, and how excited we are. It might be better actually to take longer and have lower stress. Um, and actually typically when we do use low stress handling, things tend to move smoother and may actually take less time. Um, and then there are vaccines for like uh, respiratory syncytial virus and pasteurella. The syncytial virus is a cattle vaccine and the pasteurella is for sheep. There isn't one for goats. Um, but again, that might be something that we think about on a risk basis. Um, okay. A little bit about foot rot. So foot rot is one that's direct contact or fomite. So it doesn't, the bacteria that causes foot rot doesn't really live off the sheep for very long. But if we are moving from sheep to sheep, like let's say a pair of hoof trimmers, um, that can be a really effective way of transmitting foot rot from animal to animal. Um, so there's usually a seasonal risk when it's wet and rainy, rainy out there. Um, the main signs that we see are lameness or um, really pretty bad foot conformation or hoof conformation. And then you can have poor growth and weight loss. Um, so we, a number of ways to control this disease is, one is through trying to just manage foot health. So if we can, trying to keep them out of really muddy areas, um, sometimes that is not possible. And so, you know, if you, let's say you're in a barn situation and your paddocks are just full of mud, if there is a way to try to dry that out, whether it's with rocks or straw or some way, of trying to keep them from really sinking into the mud, that, that might be helpful. Um, 
in goats, so there's a difference between goats and sheep in goats because their hooves are so much um, harder. We do need to trim them routinely, so every three to four months, uh, and that depends on how much walking they're doing. So they may wear a little bit differently, so you can gauge how often you have to hoof trim by what their hoof actually looks like. Um, and then in sheep, we typically tend to only trim the ones that are um, kind of overlong, like they're having just mechanical issues with walking because of their hoof conformation. Um, there is a vaccine for this, and then we can, might consider um, our kind of biosecurity principles with this disease and kind of if we're bringing new animals in, asking about history from the flock of origin. And I will say that the foot vax vaccine is only available currently through the California Wool Growers Association in this right. country. Right. Um, and so goat owners can also join California Wool Growers. <laughs> so, okay, well, let's talk about Clostridia um, because it is the vaccine, kind of the core vaccine that we think about. Um, Clostridia affects all ages depending on the type. So the C and D that you see in your Clostridia vaccine is for anemotoxemia. C causes bloody scours, which usually affect really young lambs um, up to two weeks of age. And then um, the D is the, over, the typical overeating disease and which usually affects lambs that are a month, two months, or even at weaning um, and causes pulpy kidney disease as well. Um, it's a bacteria with enterotoxemia. You usually you don't see signs. You can actually see death before you even see diarrhea um, because it causes such bad enteritis. So that bloody gut um, is that picture on the top right. Um, with tetanus, so that's also usually put into that mix. It's also a clostridial disease. Um, tetanus causes lockjaw and you might see um, this kind of stiffness. So this lamb on the bottom right with his head back, um, you can see the third eyelid coming up, which is the sheep on the bottom left. Um, and this usually enters, it can be through oral ingestion, but usually it's through some kind of wound. Um, so that could be at castration, it could be at tail docking, it could be any kind of injury. Um, they can be exposed to tetanus. These bacteria are everywhere. They're just in the soil. Um, so there's not a lot we can do to minimize exposure. Um, so vaccinating is why this vaccine is so important because it's such an easy way to prevent this disease that can cause such um, incredible losses.